Okay, welcome to Cleveland Heights City Council regular meeting. It is November 18th, uh, 2024. It is 8.02 p.m. Sorry about the lateness. Hattie, would you please call the roll? Cobb. Present. Kuda. Here. Larson. Here. Maddox. Here. Russell. Here. Petrus. Here. Posh. Here. All members are here. Any amendments to the agenda? Mr. President. Yes. I motion to add resolution 227-2024 to first readings for adoption. We have a second? Second. All right. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anybody opposed? All right, that motion passes. Uh, next, we're going to approve the minutes, uh, hopefully, for September 16th. Any objection to those minutes? All right. Uh, next, we have um, on the agenda a presentation from the Happy 5K, 10K folks. So I see Adam here and I see Melody. Welcome. Hey, how are you? Excuse me, I'm, I'm going to read this just so I don't miss anything. Uh, we're here for the request by Council Person Larson to update the city on the outcome of the 2020-24 Cleveland Heights Happy 5K, 10K, and One Mile All Are Welcome Run held on October 6, 2024. This was the eighth running of the Happy Run with proceeds going to the Cleveland Heights Youth Scholarship Fund. We're happy to report that this year's run was the biggest and most successful run to date. In, two, in 2024, we had 665 runners register, a uh, final number that is a handful larger than the previous, uh, largest number since pre-COVID in 2019. $20,000 was raised, we have a check, uh, for the Cleveland Heights Youth Scholarship Fund, which means the, this race is by all estimates, has by all estimates raised over $90,000 to date for the scholarship fund and the children of our community. Total raise this year was $35,232 with $15,233 in total expenses. We had 21 community sponsors, mostly Cleveland Heights merchants, 111 total donations online via the Run the Land registration page. Some of these were the actual sponsor donations, but most were community donations ranging from a dollar, $5, $10 and up, simply wishing uh, to support the fund. We had 17 running teams, some were merchant teams, most were community groups, such as the Officer Jason West Memorial Team Fund, We Love the Heights, and Dads or Dad Bods to Father Figures. We had 11 drink ticket locations with 370 tickets redeemed with a total value of $1,850 to the businesses. Of those registered, we had 650 people complete the run and again this year, we drew runners from coast to coast and internationally, including Canada and the UK. In fact, most of the registered addresses were from outside Cleveland Heights, which means the city has created a run that is truly a destination run and a regional attraction to our city. And finally, with funding from the city, this was the first year uh, Lee Road was closed between Silsby and Meadowbrook for a post-race family-friendly event. Many of those that enjoyed the post-race race, race party were kids that got to take part in activities ranging from a bounce house, bubble palooza with Dr. You Are Awesome, face painters, balloon artists, and chalk art. Local businesses, Ollie's and Sivu Play had host tables with fun interactive ch children's games and crafts. Local music artists, DJ Lily Jade and Footprints performed and tables and chairs were set on the street for the attendees about $3,200 was spent on post-race activities. Overall, the feedback was very positive and we hope to do it again next year on Sunday, October 5th, 20, 000, or 2025. We would like to thank Mayor Serene, each of the members of City Council for your resounding support, the Police Department, Chief of Police, Chief Britton, along with Samira Rhodes and Julie Kaufman from the City of Cleveland Heights. Big thank you to our merchants and sponsors and all the volunteers, the Cedar Lee Sid, our race day partner, Run the Land, and our post-race party committee led by Melody Hart, Joe DeWitt Foy, Jen Holland, Gary Benjamin, and Destiny from the Cleveland Urban Winery. And finally, the happy 5K run committee of Lou Radovoyevich from uh, Rad Graphics, Bob Safera from Sophie LaGramond, 
Councilman Jim Petras for their great work. The run would not happen, would not have happened without each of you. Thank you. Can I present this jointly to Council President and the mayor? Uh. Since you both had <laughs> ever done this. All of you. <laughs> Eddie's office. <laughs> Yeah. All right, next on the agenda um, is uh, Western Reserve Land Conservancy is going to make a uh, um, presentation. Uh, they did a study on all of the properties in Cleveland Heights, and we're so glad to have you with us today. I'll direct you, your attention to the um, screen over there. Greetings and thank you members of the council for the invitation tonight. My name is Isaac Robb and I serve as Vice President of Planning and Urban Projects for Western Reserve Land Conservancy. And we had the pleasure of partnering with not only the city of Cleveland Heights, but also the cities of Euclid and South Euclid to provide a full comprehensive property inventory uh, of your municipality. Tonight, I'm gonna have a fairly brief presentation in three sections. First, going over sort of the process and how members of your community came together to collect this robust data set. Second, we'll go over the results in some sort of key areas. And third, we'll talk about some overarching strategies and strategic alignment for how this data can be used moving forward. It goes without saying that this is a publicly facing web page, so anyone can access this at any time. All the data is available, and I'm happy to answer any questions on how to dive in a little deeper or do further analysis. So without um, further ado, we through December of 23 to April 24, all three municipalities sort of kicked off this survey. We worked in teams of two on foot in the public right of way on sidewalks to take photos and answers a series of questions on every parcel in Cleveland Heights and the other two municipalities. We answered uh, in total up to 50 questions at each parcel and took a series of photos. Those photos are time stamped and it indicates which surveyor took that record. And again, it's gonna be living in perpetuity in not only your database system, but also Neo Kandu at Case Western Reserve University. Uh, I know all of you might not be as into data or as much of an urban nerd as I am. So if I see eyes glazing over, I'll <laughs> try and speed up through this and let people read this on their own. But um, uh, first it goes, uh, it's an important point that Euclid and South Euclid conducted a property inventory in 2017. So they were sort of building off of that initial data set. We did this in Cleveland in 2015 and again in 2022. And we're really hoping that this becomes a living data set that the city of Cleveland Heights is committed to not only using in the short term, but also to add and keep it fresh moving forward. Um, each surveyor, uh, as you can see here, as you scroll through the story map, each surveyor was equipped with a tablet and Wi-Fi, as well as the, the app Regrid, which is developed by Loveland Technology out of Detroit. We've used this as over, for over 10 years now. Um, everyone can click here to see what exact questions were asked at each parcel. Um, and you can check the Regrid website here. Um, they do offer a free citizen account if you wanna pull it up and you can get a litany of basic property data that you can use and take records um, within your community as well. It's a great tool. I Before I go out on any property inventory, I go out with my mother and if she can use it, anyone can use it. And so it's very user friendly regardless of your technology background. So again, some of the main categories that we were looking for is if a parcel had an occupied structure, a vacant structure, vacant lot, park, parking lot, um, with adjacent, I won't spend too much time on it, it's if a single structure was over multiple parcels, and then anything that would fall under <clears throat> other. We combined that with existing public data on from the zoning and the county, but we indicated if a property was residential, commercial, industrial, institutional, mixed use, or other. And then we gave each structure a grade. 
A through F, A being an excellent condition, F being a, it's an extreme public ha hazard that needs to be addressed immediately, and everything in between. We also answered a series of questions on if you know, there was siding damage, peeling paint, illegal dumping, if there are inoperable vehicles on site, what the condition of the porch was, things like that. We tried to collect as much data as possible, sidewalk conditions, if there's a street tree in the tree lawn. Anything that you could want to know about the parcel, we tried to collect. Now I'm going to, I'm not going to bore you with your neighbors to the south. Um, Cleveland Heights. So again, as you can see here, you can scroll down. And by scrolling in, you can get um, to click on each parcel. So if you want to go to where you live, um, maybe a school, your favorite park, you can click into that data and see the results in real time. So I'll pull this up uh, to make this a little larger so people can see. Um, so of the uh, close to 16,000 parcels, the vast majority, over 90% are occupied structures. Cleveland Heights has very, uh, very small amount of vacant lots. Just to give people context, the city of Cleveland has 167,000 parcels, and of those 30,000 are vacant. So Cleveland's vacant parcel percentage is close to 20% of the total land area. Cleveland Heights is only 3.5%. Not to say that we need to you know, compare ourselves to Cleveland. I'm a Cleveland resident, but just the scale of the land use amongst um, some of the inner ring suburbs compared to our large city is, is pretty astounding. So again, if you uh, come over here to the, the legend, everything in blue is occupied structures, red is vacant structures. We not only look at the surveyor's interpretation, you know, if there's mail piling up, if the grass is overgrown, but we also combine it with a data set from the US Postal Service to create a vacancy indicator to get a better sense of if a parcel is occupied or not. You can then use this zoom in button here to click on specific parcels. You can see this donut is severance. And here we are, I believe. See, oh, yep, so here's a photo. So you can go in, you can click, see every photo, and then you can zoom and see, you know, um, different things like what are the windows conditions, roof conditions, um, is the building tax delinquent? I sure hope not. Um, things of that nature, what's the sidewalk condition, things of that. And again, this is available for every parcel within the city of Cleveland Heights. Going down a little deeper, um, of those occupied structures, again, the vast majority, nearly 90% received an A or B grade. That's incredibly high compared to a lot of the municipalities we work in. I think that's a testament to your building and housing department and the care that the residents of Cleveland Heights have for their housing. So 90% are in that A and B, which are good or, or excellent condition. Um, only less uh, around 150 received a D or an F. I think one of the buildings in Severance was one of those, as you can see there. And again, as you scroll in, you can see different uh, photos that give examples of different structure grades. Unsurprisingly, a lot of the vacant structures, their grades are lower. Again, you can zoom in and click on any of these parcels at your leisure. And here's an example of a vacant F structure. It looks like there was some fire damage. It's properly boarded. There's a placard on the door. <clears throat> Things are, are working as it should. This is something I'll get to a little bit later on in the strategy section, but the structure use. Of the nearly 16,000 parcels, 13,595 are single family and 1,600 are multifamily. It's not a surprise, but it's really worth um, keeping in mind that the vast majority of parcels in Cleveland Heights are residential. That's really the driving force of your community and that should take you know, the most of your attention. Uh, again, in, in our opinion. Again, vacant land, very small amount, 550 parcels. Um, typical would be if someone is, uh, maybe the county land bank owns it and is just mowing the grass. Improved is what it sounds like if there's a community garden, decorative plantings, um, tree plantings, and then distresses if there is litter or things like this. So this would be uh, something that would be considered improved. Maybe it's someone's side yard, they have a nice fence. 
And again, you can sort of see where each and every one of these vacant parcels are. We like to say that data doesn't make us smarter, but it does keep us more informed. And hopefully as you are making strategic decisions with scarce resources, you can use this data to uh, better serve your constituency. So again, if maybe that this needs to be chipped. But again, very small per percentage of the municipality. Um, we then did cross community uh, commonalities. So again, anything that received things like um, a lot of peeling paint, distressed sidewalks, um, gutter damage, and compared those for Euclid, South Euclid, and Cleveland Heights. So some of the, the key things and strategic initiatives are around code enforcement, nuisance abatements, and property tax delinquency. Again, less of an issue in Cleveland Heights, but countywide we all know the amount of delinquent taxes is a significant issue. Um, Alan Butler and his team do a great job on the code enforcement side. Again, everyone seemed to be very well aware of what the city's initiatives were, if they were out of compliance. We had a great um, interaction with a lot of the residents, the surveyors would talk to folks. Um, and, you know, Cleveland Heights and South Euclid are already using citizen serve code enforcement system, which again allows some economies of scale and regional benefits. But I want to spend just a little bit of time talking about housing since that's the vast, vast majority of your parcels and also is a bit of a, a hot button issue nationally, right? We have these sort of two narratives around housing. I think everyone recognizes that we're in a housing crisis in this country. Some people might think that we don't have enough <laughs> affordable housing. Other people might think that our housing isn't valued or is losing value, whether it's through speculative investment or things like that. Again, both of these things can be true at once. And so what I would consider, um, you know, from after doing this, this analysis is that it's really important to think about what you want the future of housing to look like in Cleveland Heights. The two largest generations in our country's history, the baby boomers and the millennials, are vying for the same types of housing at the same time. It's estimated that two thirds of Americans either live alone or as a couple, and two thirds of homes in this country are single family. So our people that are aging, 10,000 people a day are turning 65 in this country, is the housing stock in Cleveland Heights accessible to people as they age? Do you have bathrooms on the first floor? Do you have a bedroom on the first floor? As someone with aging parents, I know the housing stock in Northeast Ohio is really hard as people with mobility issues. Again, as a younger person, if you're trying to get into home ownership for the first time, are there enough starter homes in your community for people to buy? Is there enough rental for the adjacent students and younger folks that are, are renting maybe with a roommate? These are the types of things and types of questions that I hope all of you ask with this data. Does your zoning allow the type of things that you would like, backyard cottages? I know you're, you're actively looking at infill zoning and doing different things there, but if it's not easy for someone to add a bathroom on the first floor of their house, the city maybe is, doesn't have the right types of building requirements to allow your city to evolve and change over time. So again, like I said, I don't claim to have the answers tonight, but I do hope that this data evokes interesting questions and dialogues both with the administration and with members of council. So with that, I'm happy to answer any specific questions or any of the larger scale questions that I brought up towards the end. Well, thank you, Mr. Rob. This was very informative. And I take it that all council looked this over pretty good. We got a lot of good information. Any questions from council? I'm looking. Councilman? Uh, screw up. Thank you. Um, during your presentation, I went back into the, um, the app, mm -hmm. and I would encourage everybody to kind of go in and look at this and look at your neighbor's houses, you know, look at, just, just get a sense of what this is all about. It's a huge undertaking. Absolutely. And what I'm hopeful for is the, the value that we saw with some of the earlier adopters to this, like Euclid and South Euclid, and, and, and I suppose Cleveland, although I don't, I don't see their data. Um, it, it's very valuable to go back in five years later or four years later and just sort of see the difference. It's a very good way that we as a community can measure um, the value of our housing stock because our housing stock is <clears throat> our major asset. So whatever we can do to sort of review this and sort of see where we are, um, statistically over time. Um, so this is real valuable. I, I really commend you guys and, and the work that you've done. It's just really, and it's a beautiful site. It's really fun to play with and, mm -hmm. and, and really informative. 
Appreciate so thank that. you. And again, special thanks goes out to Alan Butler and his team, as well as all the surveyors that worked on this. They worked very hard and uh, were able to move through the community really, relatively quickly. Other questions or comments? Um, I have a couple if nobody else has anything. Um, so uh, 556 vacant properties. Do you sub-aggregate them with vacant and abandoned and just vacant like somebody that's maybe renting and just doesn't have anybody in there? Do we know? So under the structure, everything's sort of a kind of like one of those nesting dolls. Yeah. If you have a structure and it's vacant, that could be a vacant commercial, a vacant industrial, a vacant residential. Right. The vacant land would be something that has absolutely no structure on right. it. So that 500 number uh, council president would be just bare land. So, but what I'm asking is, is, is that sub-aggregated out anywhere where we could see those other um, divisions, uh, categories, sub, oh, subcategories? Like, yeah, we don't have that in the story map, but we could do that mapping analysis separately. Okay. And then, uh, because there, there, that is some information that I would like to Absolutely. have. I, I don't want to speak for anybody else. Um, <clears throat> I noticed that in the recommendations at the end, there were things that South Euclid is doing and that you pointed out. Mm -hmm. Are those things we should be doing? Again, I don't, I don't know what's best for your community, your residents and, and council would know better, but I will say having worked with South Euclid and Director Martin, now Director Martin O'Toole at the city of Cleveland, when she was in South Euclid, she was very strategic about this going back to 2015, 2016. And they have a very um, proactive approach to this and they were really laser focused on it for the past 10 years. So again, I would say, you know, 90% of your structures are in really good shape. So I think you, whatever you guys have been doing, I would say don't stop doing that. But again, go through, there's been a lot of good collaboration through the First Suburbs Consortium on this. And I would say, you know, pick what works for you all. Um, but maybe if, you know, South Euclid isn't exactly a one-to-one. -one, um, I know their housing stock, for example, isn't as historic as Cleveland Heights. So there are, there are certain things that are similar, but also different. Right. Well, I'll leave that to Councilman Petrus, who heads up that committee, as to what he would want to look at. And lastly, I just want to say that um, the grades A, B, C, D, E. I think it would be good if you would just have some description of what that is, what the criteria is. Yeah. Um, and maybe you do, but it would be good for us to see what I, I think the people who get the information you know, what constitutes an A, what constitutes that kind of thing. Right, yeah, and we spent a lot of time uh, going through that in the training. We do have a one page, I believe it's linked up in the methodology on sort of things to look for and indicators that differentiate an A and a B. Right. Generally, I would say it doesn't matter if your house is 100 years old or 10 years right. old, it could receive an A or an F. It's really about that level of condition. So I, I imagine if you were purchasing a home, an A property would be something that you absolutely, there's, it's pristine. There's nothing that you need to do with it. Mm -hmm. A B property, you know, maybe some of the paint's looking a little tired. The roof is maybe on your 15 out of 30. It's still very good, very solid, but you know, there maybe are some slight things, some a chipping stoop, things like that. C, it's, a, it's in fair condition. Those C properties, especially in Cleveland are what, we spend a lot of time looking at because those are the ones that are more on the tipping point um, that if maybe you get a roof repair or you know help someone with a low interest loan they could bring that up to a b or maybe even an a but if not maybe a c property is a little bit easier to buy it's a speculative investor and then d and like but if a c property is still would get a certificate of occupancy you know it's it's still in that okay. that level a d something needs to be done before it, anyone should be legally able to inhabit it. And then an F is sort of that hazard and dangerous that needs to be addressed immediately. Does that? Yeah, help? thank you. No, that's, that, those are good definitions. Uh, all right, going once, going twice. All right, thank you, Mr. Rob, thank appreciate you. it. Um, all right, we're moving on now to communications from the mayor. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, the first thing, that I'd like to um, announce as a matter of record. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
Um, so I'd like to announce to council, make a matter of record that sealed bids were received on November 15th, 2024 for project number 2412, that's uh, CH30, uh, Sanitary Sewer Overflow Control. Uh, two companies submitted bids and Triad Engineering and Contracting submitted the lowest and best bid in the amount of $722,864.82. Let's make that a matter of record. And second, I'd like to request permission to bid project 2419 East Fairfax Water Main Replacement Project. Mr. President, I motion to grant permission to the mayor to move forward with the, the project that he just described. All right. Second. We have a second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. Thank you. Um, thank you, Council. Um, second, I'd like to uh, reiterate an invitation to the community um, to provide comment on our climate action and resiliency plan. We recently uh, published a draft plan um, and we are inviting uh, commentary from the public to, to take a look at this plan, read it, um, and, and tell us what you think should be included potentially, what shouldn't be included, any comments that you might have on the plan. I can't guarantee that your particular comment will be incorporated into the plan, but um, this is sort of a part of making sure that we're taking as much into account as possible as we're planning our activities for how we are going to um, manage in this city, uh, whatever climate change brings our way. Um, and so please take a look at our website um, and, and do a search for the Climate Action and Resiliency Plan. Um, or if you are subscribed to our newsletter, we had a link in the last uh, e-news, the city news. Um, you can also subscribe to that newsletter on our website if you see fit. Um, third, I'd like to announce, and some of you may have seen this already, um, but I would like to announce um, that the city of Cleveland Heights is the recipient of an $800,000 grant from U.S. Department of Transportation. Um, this requires a $200,000 match from the city of Cleveland Heights. Um, this grant is for the Safe Streets and Roads for All program. You may remember that we applied for and received a $225,000 grant from the federal government to begin our Safe Streets for All plan. Um, and, and that planning process is wrapping up now, but we didn't want to let an opportunity go by. So even though we're not quite done with the plan, we wanted to make sure that we applied for um, some additional funds to do a demonstration project. And so we will have a uh, million dollars for uh, making sure that our roads and streets are safer for pedestrians and cyclists, um, you know, attempting to change uh, the corridor designs, attempting to uh, make our crosswalks more visible and useful for pedestrians and drivers. Um, and so we're still in the process of completing that plan. We anticipate um, that will be released relatively soon. I wanted to thank, um, everybody who was involved in this, especially our uh, technical advisory committee who uh, played a big role in, in moving this forward and moving the plan forward so that we could be best positioned to make use of more federal dollars. Um, and then lastly, I, you know, without getting into too many specifics, I, I did want to mention that um, between Friday and now we had two incidents, relatively public incidents of people in our community um, is deciding to take their own lives. Um, on Friday, we had a report of um, death by suicide on Fairmount. And I believe yesterday, another report of uh, an individual taking their life over on Belfield. And I just wanted to take a moment to uh, encourage people, whether it's you or somebody that you know, 
Um, check, check in with people you know and care about and see if they're doing all right. I know uh, life is not easy and uh, deaths of despair, I think are something that can be preventable. Um, sometimes all it takes is reaching out to a friend that you know is having a hard time. Um, and, and if you or, or someone you care about um, is, is dealing with suicidal thoughts um, and, and you wanna do something about it, I, I just wanna encourage everybody to call 988, um, which is the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline. Uh, please call 988, talk to somebody. Just talking to somebody could save your life. Um, and if you want to uh, chat with somebody, I think you can do that online as well. So it's um, chat.988lifeline.org. Um, if you or somebody you know is having trouble, please remember those resources. Um, and with that, um, Council, that's, that's all I have. Thank you. All right, thank you, Mayor. We're gonna move on now to the city administrator's report. Danny Williams. Council President, members of council, Mayor, um, this is my last meeting with you as a city administrator. And I just want to take a moment to offer my profound gratitude for this opportunity to serve our great city. You know, much has been accomplished during this first phase of this new experiment in city government. And uh, I think the mayor outlined a lot of that progress during his state of the city. But we're, we've not reached our full potential. But I'm confident that with continued constructive collaboration between the administration and council, we can get to the point where we all expect to be and deserve to be um, in, in terms of the city's potential. So I look forward to, to uh, monitoring that progress as a private citizen. If you're not careful in improving your screening process, you may even see me bumping around here on some committee or commission, <laughs> um, offering whatever uh, advice and counsel I can. But uh, this is, I, I just want to take a minute to, to thank you all for this, this opportunity and wish you well. I have great expectations for where this city can go. And uh, I look forward to being a part of it. All right, so until then, peace out. Um, anybody want to say anything? I don't want to preclude that from him. Okay. Well, Mr. President, yes. I'm going to wish him well and thank you so much for your service and your commitment to the city. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure working with you. I hope life treats you well. You know, we've had some interesting and kind of intense conversations, and I feel like I learned a lot from you. And um, I, you know, I'm, I'm now I now when I see you out and out and about, I, I know who you are. <laughs> we can say hello. I'm looking forward to that. Um, okay, uh, next on the agenda, uh, any departmental reports? I think we're going to meet Mr. Gonzalez. Hey, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Andres Gonzalez. I'm the new director of Parks and Recreation. Um, I don't have much of a report today, but I just wanted to come up and introduce myself. Um, just basically say thank you guys for the opportunity to serve this great city. Um, seeing the foundation that's already existing in Parks and Recreation, um, hearing the mayor's vision of what he w wants and accomplished for the Parks and Recreation Department, and then also um, just seeing the great staff that's already in place, I'm very, very excited to build off of that foundation and I'm super excited to hit the ground running. So I, I'm always available if you guys need anything. Um, so thank you guys and look forward to working with each and every one of you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, welcome, welcome. Where are you from, by the way? I'm a West Sider. I live in the city of Brook Park. Okay. Yeah. But look, um, I come from the city of Brook Park um, administrative wise as well, too. So I was the Parks and Recs director, city of Brook Park, and uh, longtime resident, still a resident over there. So wonderful. Look forward to the commute back and forth every single <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> So I know the answer to this. How long have you been in the field? Uh, 20 plus years. 
Yeah, I, I believe it or not, I actually started at the tender age of 14 years old in Parks and Recreation. <laughs> um, worked my way, I started as a scorekeeper. Uh, oh my God. Like, like many people in Parks and Recreation do, just kind of working your way in different angles, um, wherever you get called, you do. And been lucky enough to work my way up to director of Parks and Recreation for City of Brook Park and kind of grew out of that. Um, city of 18,000 residents. So I'm excited to come here, you know, and serve the 45,000 residents of the city of Cleveland Heights. Great. Yeah. Well, good to meet you. Thank you so much. You're Appreciate welcome. it. All right, next we have the report of the clerk of council. Nothing to report. All right, we'll move on to public comment. First uh, legislative agenda items only. Uh, when your name is called, you have three minutes. Uh, you can come up to the mic, say your name, the street you live on. Drew Hertzig. We go. Drew Herzig, Bradford Road, Cleveland Heights. Councilors, Mr. Mayor, this Wednesday, November 20th, is traditional transgender day of remembrance. Pride in the Heights and Trans Ohio are having an observance at the community center at seven o'clock this Wednesday, seven to eight p.m. I want to thank the mayor and the mayor's office for arranging that the city is allowing us to use that facility. Everyone is invited this Wednesday, November 20th, 7 p.m. at the community center in the South Atrium. Transgender Day of Remembrance is a day to remember all the lives that were lost to trans violence over the past year. It was started in 1999 by Gwendolyn Ann Smith in memory of her friend, trans woman, Rita Hester, who was killed in the previous year. And every year since then, we've taken the time to remember these lives lost. It's not a day of celebration, it's a day of mourning, but it's a determination that these lives will not pass unnoticed and unhonored. Unfortunately, we can expect more trans deaths coming up. Right now, the governor of Ohio has a bill on his desk that will basically criminalize being trans in public. It will deprive people of being participants in the life of their community. One of your bathrooms out here may even be declared illegal because it's not marked gender one or the other kind of thing. It puts a target on the back of every trans people. And if you think the suicide rate is bad now, wait until a law like that comes into effect. So this is, I wish that I have, Ohio weren't one of the ground zeros on transphobia and misogyny, but that's where we're at. So we ask again for your protection and support in this. And I want to remind you that trans people, non-binary people, gender diverse people do not owe the public any sort of gender performance. We will not wear special clothing. We will not interact in a special way. We will not behave a certain ways. You will not know us when you see us, which means you have to be fair to everybody. And I wish I could say that I, my experience from this council is that, but no, this is not a safe place for people, whether they're dealing with mental health issues or gender issues kind of thing. So maybe you can work on that. Since this is part of the topic, nobody wants to report somebody who's contemplating suicide and have the police show up and end in a death. We need to do better with that. We need to make sure that any mental health crisis report is answered by a social worker, not by a person with a gun. This has to be a change and it can start here because you have the power to authorize that kind of thing. I'm drifting a little bit, but again, transgender people need your support. We are dying in, in numbers that should not be happening kind of thing. This Wednesday is just one day out of the year where we pause to remember then people are dying who shouldn't die. Again, victims of misogyny and transphobia. It's part of the assault on bodily autonomy that's going on across the country. Women's health care, gender affirming care for young people and transgender rights kind of thing. So please support us as much as you can, not just on Wednesday, but every day. Thank you very much. That's it for legislative agenda items. Okay, public comment, General. Arthur Blakey II. Yes, hello. Um, yeah, I am um, Arthur Blakey uh, from Lancaster Sire um, Road. I um, am part of the Stolen Lives Project, and I'm standing with the Christian family who recently have lost their son to the scourge of police brutality and murder that has been increasing in this country. As we can say now that there have been more police murders that have happened in the United States of America then there were lynchings before the civil rights movement. And this has been escalating 
ever since um, after George Floyd, where in Ohio in itself in the past 20 years, there are 479 murders that have happened in the state of Ohio, not including the Christian family and maybe a few others just in the past six months. And my sister, uh, Kander, was also murdered by a Cleveland police officer back in 1989. And I have been in this standing with families um, ever since then for the past 25 years under the Storm of Lies project. And I say that this family, you know, there are a lot of things that were promised, there are a lot of things that were said, you know, and they are not being done. And um, this is where, you know, we experience from every family, you know, that goes through this, you know, the slowness of justice, especially for police officers. These police officers need to be exposed. This case need to be taken more seriously than it has been. And it is time that this family goes more towards justice. So I am standing standing with the Christian family and that's what, that's what I'm saying right now. So thank you. Bill Swain. Okay. I want to know why everybody's so goddamn quiet up there. You got nothing to say, but you had an executive meeting. What did you say? That, did you talk about what happened to him? Did you talk about that? The point is the history of black people in this society is that black people mean nothing. And that's the same with Christian. The fact that nothing's come down in terms of evidence, transparency, it says exactly the point. Black people in America have nothing but grief, nothing but heartache. That's what black people are about. Nina Simone didn't just say that because she felt like it. She felt it because she knows it. So my point is, I like to hear somebody from here speak to the issue of uh, what happened to Christian and why it's an epidemic in this society, in America. If you have nothing to say, you're telling, you're telling me exactly what you want to, I guess that's what you want to say. Man, that's pitiful. That's outrageous. The family is here. Uh, tons of the people are here. Where's his picture anyway? Here, let me hold that. That's a brother, that's a beautiful brother. And that's a brother, that's a brother that means something to us. So I'd like to know why no, everyone's quiet. I mean, the man was murdered in his backyard. Come on, don't you have any heart? I guess not. I don't know, I don't know where anybody's talking about shit. Sarah Thomas Peterson. And I'll tell you straight up, we need a revolution. We need to get rid of this whole system that thinks black people aren't shit. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna move to the next person. I'm sorry, who is it? Sarah Thomas Peterson. I'm gonna just set it here. I'm going to read mine because, of course, you know, trauma. So I want to stay on point. I have a few questions for you all that hopefully you all will be able to either answer today or in some time with us. First, why was there no staff trained in mental health crisis management available during, during the incident with Christian? The presence of a trained professional could significant, significantly de-escalate situations that provide the necessary support to individuals in crisis. Why are officers permitted to forego crisis prevention measures and instead opt for the use of assault rifles? Especially given its lethal potential, it's alarming that such a choice was made that night and it raises serious questions about the protocols and training provided to CHPD officers. The apparent conscious or unconscious bias should give us all pause, 
especially city leadership. Managing bias is a part of you all's job to make sure the city is safe. How does the current practice of militarized policing align with the mayor's vision for a modern, progressive, inclusive future? The use of military grade equipment and tactics in CHPD police force seems contradictory to the values of inclusivity and progressiveness that were highlighted in the mayor's speech last week, which we did attend. And thank you for answering the questions, but it's just, it's not in alignment. I believe it is essential to address this apparent discrepancies to ensure that Cleveland Heights policies and practices truly reflect the vision presented by the city's leadership. Implementing better oversight through a civilian review board and regulating the use of assault rifles by police officers is not only a matter of public safety, but also cost effective. Let me speak you all's language because I do know what I'm talking about. I'm a clinical social worker. I've been in mental health for almost 20 years. Proactive measures such as such as these significantly reduce the financial and social costs associated with mitigating the aftermath of fatal shootings by preventing such incidents through improved oversight and regulation. You can avoid the substantial expenses related to legal proceedings and community unrest. We're all going to be here later. You all are going to be here later. This is time. People are on the clock. This is you all's this is the, the taxpayer's money. Uh, ultimately fostering a safer and more physically responsible community. I wanna tell you a little bit about why, I wanna tell you a little bit about what some of these changes in oversight will save another family from. My mother and my brother Jonathan called me on three-way right before 11 p.m. that evening and told me something had happened at my brother Farrell's house. They didn't know what, and he was not answering the phone. I immediately got out of bed and told them, I'll call him, he'll answer the phone for me. But he didn't. Instead, I received a phone call from my mother two minutes later, wailing in the phone. In that moment, I now know in hindsight, I regressed from a 37-year-old woman to a little girl saying, mommy, mommy, what's wrong? I was terrified. <laughs> she couldn't speak and in those 60 seconds, I couldn't breathe, I couldn't move. All I could do was brace myself for what I knew was going to be the worst li news of my life, no matter who was gone. Jackie's grandfather took the phone Jackie's grandfather took the phone and told me that the police had shot and killed Christian. I collapsed on the floor. <laughs> I collapsed on the floor, but I knew I had to pull myself together to call my other brother, Jonathan, and tell him Christian was gone. I immediately got my husband up and told him to wake the baby and get dressed. I have to go get my brother and his kids. Seeing Christian laying there lifeless and bloody while still having to talk to the police, hold my brother and his children is a memory that plagues me of every moment of every day. What else plagues me is as I walked up to my mother that night, watching her in those flashing lights, she was almost unrecognizable. She had aged 10 years from this one moment, this vibrant, beautiful woman, my role model had aged 10 years. The moment this moment of callous, unethical, incompetent disregard that took Christian's life. The hardest thing in my life I ever had to do was leave Christian there that night alone with the people who murdered him. Something that I don't know if I will ever be able to live with. Since, I have to, since I've had to plan a funeral, protest, organize, fight, grieve, comfort, hold, work, giving the mental health care and treatment that Christian should have gotten that night to my own patients while still having to raise my daughter and care for my husband. This is the social cost. And I'm just his aunt. I'm just his aunt. His father, 
my mother, his cousins who grew up with him. All I did was help raise him. His mother, his sister, who can't even be in Cleveland no more. This is the social cost. This is what bias, uncontrolled police, and disregard for life costs. It's too much to write, too much for you all to fathom, and not in, at all in alignment with the city of Cleveland Heights mission statement. I will remind you, since it seems that leadership and your police department have forgotten, your mission statement reads, our mission is to protect all things that matter most to our residents and visitors, to ensure the safe and desirable community through delivery of excellent services. In a responsive open, sustainable, and physically responsible manner by caring and competent professionals. That's not what we received and our family will forever be traumatized for it. Christian mattered to us and still does. And that's why I urge city council to address these issues promptly and implement necessary changes to ensure the safety and well-being of all community members. And if you all do not do it, we will make sure it is on the ballot as well as, well as your jobs, period. Thank you. Shalana Freed. Shalana Freed, Babbitt Road. Good evening, Councilman and Mayor. I'm Shalana Freed and I'm the Executive Director for Strong Hands United. We're a nonprofit organization that focuses on community safety, especially for the youth, and we promote human traffic awareness. At the top of the year, the mayor said, any amount of violence is too much, and it's made more heart rendering when young people are involved. Strong Hands United could not agree more and a response to the increased violence among our youth in our city, Strong Hands United is offering to bring our program, Lifelines 216, into Cleveland Heights. The mayor and all council members have received an initial proposal outlining our program. It not only teaches violence deterrence behaviors, but it addresses some of the root causes that perpetuates violence among young people. Our program offers two six-week cycles and each week addresses one of the identified causes, explores it through interactive activities, has a speaker, and culminates with a facilitated roundtable discussion with the meal. At the completion of the cycle, there will be a graduation for each participant, and they will receive a small stipend. Some of the topics that are dis will be discussed are some of the things that we talked about today that I've heard about, breaking mental health stigmas, nonviolent ways of expression, how to become more engaged in community, your circumstances. Lifelines 216 will cater to those youth who have been identified as at risk. We will work with schools and hopefully with the courts to identify those that would benefit from our program. We work with many local nonprofits and will seek partnership with them in recruiting as well. We will continue to work with our students post-graduation and track their progress. Strong Hands United has worked with neighboring cities like East Cleveland and Cleveland offering resources and programs focused around safety and violence prevention for over five years. We recently were one of the recipients of the Cleveland Community Commission grant as part of a collaborative group. We do extensive programming in the promotion of human trafficking awareness as well. We continue to offer programming and events to the youth to ensure that they are safe. It's my sincere hope that you will consider Strong Hands United and our program as a viable program that is ready to help attack and deal with helping create a safer Cleveland Heights. Thank you. Mike Beer. My apologies, Beyer. Good evening, uh, my name is Mike Byer. I'm a resident uh, and homeowner on Grandview Avenue. Uh, I appreciate the city of Cleveland Heights making the Western Reserve Land Conservancy's comprehensive assessment of housing conditions available for public viewing. In my limited review of it, I have found that the survey is comprehensive in that it is citywide. 
but it is far from comprehensive and accurate measurement for, uh, of the true conditions of housing, at least in my neighborhood, which causes me to question its accuracy and its usefulness as a tool in guiding housing policy and resources for the entire city. My assessment of this assessment is informed by my lengthy career in the housing field and my knowledge of my neighborhood consisting of Grandview and Belfield Avenues in which I have lived for 25 years. Here are just three of my observations, but there are many others that don't, time doesn't permit right now. The property to my south owned by an absent landlord who is significantly negligent received a grade of B despite the weed filled overflowing gutters, severely rotted garage and deplorable yard which has yet to receive its first cleanup or grass cutting of the year. In this, if this house were to receive a full exterior inspection today, it would receive a grade of C at best, most likely a D. There are five vacant structures in my neighborhood. The survey identifies only two, one of which is actually occupied. One of the five vacant houses was assessed as occupied, even though it has been vacant for more than 25 years that I have lived in the neighborhood. Another property, 2243 Grandview Avenue, was reported as having a grade A house with very good components even though the house on this property was demolished 10 years ago and it is now a vacant lot. These are just a few of my observations among the approximately 156 properties in my immediate vicinity. Based on my sample, it's concerning to think that the number of misevaluations there may exist throughout the entire city. For example, if the survey identified only two vacant structures in my neighborhood, but there are actually five, might the conservancy's figure of 356 vacant structures in the entire city be undercounted by the same 150% margin of error? The conservancy's survey may offer some definition of deteriorated housing when zooming out to a very high elevation, but as a detailed diagnostic tool, this survey omits conditions not evident during a momentary view of one side of the property. I sincerely hope the positive interpretation of this superficial and questionable report does not lead the city administration or council to think that Cleveland Heights can relax its concern with housing conditions. With all due respect to the conservancy, I see limited value in this report and over-reliance on it may lead to a misdirection of resources and continued deterioration of the city's housing stock. Thank you for your time. Chris Brace. Good, let me get this adjusted right. Uh, good evening, folks. Um, for those who don't know me, my name is Chris Brace. I'm a resident of Cleveland Heights and a member of the Technical Advisory Committee to the Safe Streets for All Commission. Uh, it's a pleasure to speak with you all tonight. Uh, I'm here to tell you something that you already know. Uh, the streets aren't safe. Uh, how are they not safe? Well, many ways, but uh, in our case, the streets are not safe uh, for drivers, for pedestrians, for cyclists, for residents of our city. I could give you the numbers. Uh, you've all seen them. Over $100 million a year in damages to persons, property, the city's bottom line, but most importantly, lives. I could tell you stories, but you all have your own. We all know that the streets aren't safe. We can all think of a time when we didn't feel safe or a neighbor didn't feel safe on our streets. And we know it's a problem. We're investing in our sewers. We're investing in our public works. We need to invest in our streets to bring up roads that have not been properly overhauled in well over a hundred years. Uh, <clears throat> ultimately, I could complain forever, but I like to be solutions oriented. So here are three for budget season. Uh, for one, I'm excited to hear about the receival of those grants. Uh, this will make a massive impact. And if we can allocate the kinds of funds that have been discussed in terms of traffic calming for next year, we can combine, we can end up with well over a million dollars in this program. We will outspend per person uh, the city of Cleveland and cement ourselves as a regional leader in traffic safety, traffic calming, and addressing the historic issues and inequities of our roadways. 
that is an exciting possibility, one I didn't know about before tonight. And it's the kind of legacy that I think we should aspire to as a city. Uh, for two, we need to continue to build our capabilities. Uh, planning and public works have put a great deal of time and effort into building our internal expertise in creating great places. We need to build on that. Tonight we are bidding, uh, the council will be hearing numerous engineering projects that will involve substantial external design portions. We need to be able to bring some of that in house to hire a full-time professional engineer to design our sewers, design our streets. It will save us money and improve the quality of infrastructure that we have by giving us control over the things that we build. Finally, we need to allocate this money in the places that it matters most. Last year, Public Works did an admirable job trying to spend the money that was allocated to them, but they struggled because this is not their wheelhouse. They are fundamentally tasked with maintaining what exists and putting out a hundred fires with duct tape and string. Uh, the leadership of this project needs to go to the planning department, the department that has led our safe streets for all process, designed and led the implementation. They must be the stewards of the funding for traffic calming in this city. They will work with public works. They must collaborate with public works to get this done but they are the thought leaders and the visionaries that will make this next generation of infrastructure a success for us, uh, for our city, for our neighbors, and leave a legacy of safety and mobility for the entire city. Thank you. Mary Kelsey. I'm Mary Kelsey. I live on Meadowbrook Boulevard in Cleveland Heights, and I'm here just to request something for the Climate Action and Resilience Plan. Oh, sorry. Is that better? Okay, Mary Kelsey. I live on Meadowbrook Boulevard in Cleveland Heights. Uh, I want to request something for the Climate Action and Resilience Plan, that there be a public comment period so that we, people who haven't looked at it yet can have a reasonable time to do so. I received this plan in the city uh, newsletter at six o'clock on Friday night, and the uh, comment period ends on Wednesday. So that leaves effectively four days to read 134 pages. So I respectfully request that it be revised to extend to Friday, December 6, which would be effectively two weeks. It's actually longer, but one of those weeks is Thanksgiving, and we all know that Nobody has time to read 134 pages during Thanksgiving week. So that's all. Thank you. That's all we have. All right. Thank you, everybody. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Mr. President. Oh, yes. I did, I did want to uh, at least provide a little bit of clarification just very briefly. Um, I, I appreciate the request to extend um, and, and I'll, I'll take that and, and talk with the team about that. Um, but I, I did want to at least clarify, we did, um, announce the, the release of the, um, the, the climate action and resiliency plan, um, earlier than last week, um, and, and, and requested people to provide comment. And I mentioned it in the, the state of the city as well. Um, so I just I just wanted to let everybody know we did uh, release that draft um, at, the, at the beginning of the month, toward the beginning of the month. Um, but I will I'll take a look at extending that. Thank you. All right, and I I just want to say to everybody from uh, Christian's family, um, Farrell Thomas, the son. Uh, he was a former student of mine. We spent a few hours together. Um, about a week and a half ago. Uh, what an unfortunate way <clears throat> to to get to know Christian after he passed. Um, but in our own ways, we um, are all reaching out to the family. Um, and uh, 
I, I just want you to know that we care and um, we are always welcome here. Um, and I hope that uh, when we get some answers, you know, I know there's an investigation kind of, come, come, please, sir, we, we, no, 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 we're not gonna do this. We're not gonna do this. I, one of the things, one of the things we like to do, sir, please, one of the things we like to do here is listen, we've learned an awful lot from you. There were a lot of things we didn't know. Um, and this time that we just had was your time to come in front of us and we do appreciate, and you're always welcome here. We're now gonna move on to uh, legislation, uh, first readings for consideration for adoption. So, uh, Addie, go ahead. No, no, no. Un understood. Ma'am, ma'am, it's called cover up. M m m okay, no, no, right. No, the, the, we're, let's be clear. I want to like, I, you know, about the, the, I didn't mention some of that stuff, but I would at least like to know is that one is that standard practice with the assault rifle? Is that standard? Is that standard? Please understand something. We're the legislative branch of government. We, I, I know, but I'm just going to say this because I think people are looking here and thinking we have answers to these questions and we don't. We're not even on that end of the government. But obviously at some point there will be a report. And at that time, if, if council wants to respond to that, at that point, you know, certainly we could do that. But I just want you to know for now, we've learned a lot from you this time and the, and the time before. We do appreciate the information. Um, we do have an agenda we have to get through, so we're gonna do that now. Um, Andy, go ahead and start with the first readings for consideration for adoption. I have resolution number 212-2024 on first reading, a resolution authorizing the mayor to enter into an agreement with A&J Cement Contractors Inc for the implementation of the concrete driveways, aprons, sidewalks, and pathways program, and declaring the necessity that this legislation become immediately effective as an emergency measure introduced by Mayor Saren. Right, do we have a motion? So moved. All right, is there a second? Second. All right, any discussion? Uh, just for everybody who's here, you know, we did discuss these things in detail in Committee of the Whole. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. Next, I have resolution number 213-2024 on first reading, a resolution authorizing the mayor to enter into an agreement with Roman and Concrete Inc. for the implementation of the concrete driveways, aprons, sidewalks, and pathways program, and declaring the necessity that this legislation become immediately effective as an emergency measure introduced by Mayor Saren. So moved. Second. All right, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. Next, I have resolution number 214-2024 on first reading, a resolution authorizing an agreement with Lavery Automotive Sales and Services LLC for the purchase of two Chevy Bolt EVs, waiving competitive bidding and declaring the necessity that this legislation become immediately effective as an emergency measure introduced by Mayor Saren. So moved. A second. Second. All right. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? A motion passes. Sorry. Next, I have resolution number 215-2024 on first reading, a resolution authorizing the mayor to enter into an agreement with GPD Group for engineering services associated with the replacement of the existing sanitary sewer along Lamberton Road from Scarborough Road to Fairmount Boulevard within the city in order to control SSO CH50, providing compensation therefore and declaring the necessity that this legislation become immediately effective as an emergency measure introduced by Mayor Saren. So, so moved. moved. All right, do we have a second? Second. Thank you. Um, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. Next, I have resolution number 216-2024 on first reading, a resolution authorizing the mayor to enter into an agreement with Wade Trim Inc. for construction administration and resident observation services relating to the Hampshire SSO control project and declaring the necessity that this legislation become immediately effective as an emergency measure introduced by Mayor Saren. So moved. Second. All right, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. 
Next, I have resolution number 217-2024 on first reading, a resolution authorizing the mayor to enter into an agreement with Wade Trim, Inc. for construction administration and resident observation services relating to the Yellowstone Road storm sewer, sanitary sewer, and water main replacement project and declaring the necessity that this legislation become immediately effective as an emergency measure introduced by Mayor Saren. So moved. Second. All right, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. Next, I have ordinance number 218-2024 on first reading, an ordinance to amend certain subparagraphs of ordinance number 198-2023 relating to appropriations and other expenditures of the City of Cleveland Heights, Ohio for the fiscal year ending December 31st, 2024, repeal the prior version of ordinance number 198-2023 and declaring the necessity that this legislation become immediately effective as an emergency measure introduced by Mayor Saren. So moved. So moved. <laughs> Second. All right, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. Next, I have resolution number 219-2024 on first reading as amended. Uh, resolution authorizing the mayor to enter into an agreement with Frank Novak and Sons to furnish the labor, material, and equipment to perform the sandblasting, painting, and related services to repair the Cumberland Pool and declaring the necessity that this legislation become immediately effective as an emergency measure introduced by Mayor Saren. So moved. Second. All right, any discussion? I'll just say hallelujah. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. Next, I have resolution 220-2024 on first reading, a resolution authorizing the mayor to enter into a partnership agreement with Friends of Mendelssohn to participate in the Environmental Protection Agency Community Change Grant Program to fund projects on the former Park Synagogue campus and elsewhere in the city and declaring the necessity that this legislation become immediately effective as an emergency measure introduced by Mayor Saren. So moved. Second. All right, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. Next, I have resolution number 221-2024 on first reading, a resolution authorizing the mayor to enter into agreements with various professional audio, visual, and lighting services and equipment providers for the professional services and equipment to upgrade Kane Park's production capabilities in accordance with ordinance number 179-2023 and declaring the necessity that this legislation become immediately effective as an emergency measure introduced by Mayor Saren. So moved. Second. Any discussion? You know, I'd just like to say that I really believe that this equipment is going to transform Kane Park and put us in the major leagues of bringing in top acts. I also think in the long run, it's going to save us money. Um, and uh, this is, I, I think I think we're looking for a, 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 a brand new Kane Park almost uh, in 2025. So looking forward to this. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? <laughs> Motion passes. Next, I have ordinance number 222. Dash 2024 on first reading, an ordinance authorizing the mayor to solicit statements of qualifications from design build firms for the Kane Park restroom renovation projects and declaring the necessity that this legislation become immediately effective as an emergency measure introduced by Mayor Saren. So moved. Second. All right, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. Next, I have resolution number 227-2024 on first reading. A resolution authorizing an amendment to the contract with Tanya R. Richardson for personal training services and declaring the necessity that this legislation become immediately effective as an emergency measure introduced by Mayor Saren. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any, oppo any opposed? Uh, I mean, no, no, no one opposed and uh, motion passes. We're moving on now to first readings only. First, I have ordinance number 223-2024 on first reading, an ordinance declaring the improvements to certain real property within the city to be a public purpose, describing the public improvements to be made in direct benefit to such parcels, exempting such improvements from ad valorem real property taxation, requiring the owner of the improvements to make service payments in lieu of ad valorem real property taxes, and establishing a municipal public improvement tax increment equivalent fund for the deposit of service payments in lieu of ad valorem property taxes, all pursuant to sections 5709.40, 5709.42, and 5709.43 of the Ohio Revised Code, and declaring the necessity that this legislation become immediately effective as an emergency measure introduced by Mayor Saren. 
I also have resolution number 226-2024 on first reading, a resolution authorizing an expanded scope of work for the grant to the Heights Arts Collaborative Inc. through ordinance number 179-2023 and declaring the necessity that this legislation become immediately effective as an emergency measure introduced by President Kuda. And now on to the consent agenda. I have resolution number 224-2024 on first reading, a resolution recognizing December 2024 as Universal Month for Human Rights and December 10th, 2024 as Human Rights Day and declaring the necessity that this legislation become immediately effective as an emergency measure introduced by Vice President Russell. I also have resolution number 225-2024 on first reading, a resolution recognizing November 20th, 2024 as Transgen Transgender Day of Remembrance in the city of Cleveland Heights and declaring the necessity that this legislation become immediately effective as an emergency measure introduced by Mayor Saren. All right, do uh, I have a motion to suspend the rules? I'll move to suspend the rules. Okay, do we have a second? Second. All right, uh, all in favor of suspending the rules? Aye. Aye. Okay, and now we'll move for adoption. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Those two motions pass. Move on now to committee reports. Councilwoman Larson. Um, <clears throat> the Finance Committee met November 4th. Frank Ford was our guest. We outlined the data collection we'd like to use for a scope of work for a data analysis. And Council Member Maddox agreed to compile a list of lending programs available to predominantly black neighborhoods. Municipal Services and Environmental Sustainability Commit Committee met this morning. We discussed billing for extra garbage bins, business recycling, summer sprinkling discounts, citywide plugged sewer drains, and contents of the brine to be used with the new equipment that Public Works has purchased. Thank you, President Kuda. Mr. President? Uh, yes. Um, may I share a report? Of course. Thank you. The Housing and Building Committee met today at 5 p.m. here on the second floor of City Hall. Among other things, Councilwoman Larson shared an update on our research regarding the parking of commercial vehicles in residential areas. It is likely that we're going to schedule a hearing for that in the near future. Uh, we also, among other things, discussed um, the tenant and landlord rights and responsibilities that we've been working on for a number of months. The law department was able to provide a draft to us. Thank you, Mr. President. You're welcome. Any other committee reports? Vice President Russell. Not quite a committee report, but things I've been working on. We had a second public hearing uh, for the dog park on November 6th. Uh, great information that was given. Uh, please review the... Uh, taping for that. Uh, I will be talking, uh, meeting with the law director on Friday to see what our next steps are for the dog park. Also, I will be talking to the law director about an amendment to funding um, lifeguards for the uh, pool as well. Thank you, Council Vice President. Any other committee reports? All right, let's move on to ye old business. Any new business? Uh, wow. Okay, council member comments. It's kind of like, oh, go ahead. I just want to say that it is very hard uh, to sit here on a lot of occasions and not to be able to say something or respond to situations that happen within the public, like what happened today. Our heart goes out to the family but the community has to understand as legislators, we are not a part of the administration. So we cannot give orders, we cannot direct, we cannot do anything when it comes to police or safety or any of those things. That is not our role. Our role is legislators to create legislation from what we hear from the residents. I did um, mention that we did have a racial justice task force that uh, no longer exists as of right now, but I have talked to President Kuda uh, about maybe bringing that back in some type of shape, some type of uh, way to kind of help the community deal with different things like this. How, I don't know as of yet, but it was something that I brought up to say, well, maybe we do have use for 
the racial justice task force. We just got to figure out a way of how to use them. But um, I just wanted the family to know and the residents to know it is very hard for us. And I am speaking for myself, but I'm quite sure the rest of us here is very hard to sit here and listen and want you all want a response from us, but we can't give you one because we know as as little as you know, probably not as much as you know about the situation or the case. But I just wanted to say that because I know the family was very hurt, but I just needed to be able to let the family know as legislators, we have no control at all. We only know what we have been told and a lot of things we hear and know through reading the newspaper or through you all giving us the information. So um, my heart goes out, still goes out to the family and hopefully when we find out more, we will be able to respond better. Thank you. All right, thank you, Council Vice President. Uh, the Council President's report, the only thing I would uh, say to the public is watch the budget hearings. They start tomorrow at 10 a.m. And uh, they're, they start at 10 a.m. Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. The budget um, is a reflection of our values and direction. And uh, I we, we want as much uh, input from the community as we can get. Um, chances are, I don't have a crystal ball, but chances are in December, we will vote on this. Uh, probably not at the first meeting, but there will be time for the public to get up to the lectern and if there's something that, you know, burning issue, something that they think we need to be doing uh, that we're not doing or something that we, um, <clears throat> you know, just need to modify. I really want to encourage the public to attend and uh, weigh in on the budget. And with that, this meeting is adjourned at 923.